thank you all for joining us. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. Um, I'm Julie Bazan, Executive Director of the Bennett Career Management Center. Thank you all for joining us. This is a, a really exciting presentation that we have uh, set for you with uh, two amazing alumni panelists. It is my pleasure to welcome you, and I'd like to thank my colleagues from the Bennett Career Management Center, Latanya Johns, Helen Wang, Mark Sullivan, and from Advancement, Kate Kataya, who really was put everything together for us behind the scenes. So thank you all very much for being here, joining us. And of course, thank you to our two panelists. Um, I'll do a, a brief introduction for both of you and I will go in alphabetical order. So, uh, so as not to have to pick, I, I'll do it the, the politically correct way. So we'll start with Michael Chen, who is uh, the class of 2002 for the MBA. Mr. Chen is a partner at Monitor Deloitte based in Beijing. He serves clients in the automotive OEMs, financial services, consumer products, telecom operators, and media's group in China. He has rich experience in the areas of market entry, growth strategy, branding, CRM, channel management, and customer service. Prior to his consulting career, Mr. Chen uh, has served in several luxury brand auto OEMs, which is why he's here with us tonight, uh, responsible for marketing and strategy functions, as well as Chinese central government. Uh, Michael is fluent in English and Mandarin Chinese. And just so that you know, some of his project experience, which is vast, includes uh, global automotive captive finance company org design, global auto e OEM digital transition strategy, strategy design, largest mixed service financial service company CRM program launch, and large telecom operator precision sales outsourcing. So, Michael, thank you very much for joining us. We're looking forward to this. And then his counterpart for this evening is Sarah Spoto, MBA, class of 2017. Sarah is the Strategic Brand Manager, Luxury Automobiles at General Motors Shanghai. So, Sarah is passionate about understanding consumers, developing powerful products, and bringing new business to life. She's a former fashion apparel buyer with experience managing product lines at Land's End and American Eagle Outfitters. She's had a lifelong past passion for automotive. And after her first year at Simon, she broke into that industry via an internship at Fiat Chrysler Automobiles. After graduation, Sarah joined General Motors and has gained experience in experiential marketing, product marketing, and brand management. Today, she is proud to be part of General Motors' electric vehicle future. And we're gonna hear all about that. She is currently the strategic brand manager for the GM China premium import team. And while at Simon, Sarah led Net Impact and, Simon, and the Simon Venture Fund. She enjoyed helping students as a student career advisor and second year coach. She is also an entrepreneur, it, big surprise, right? Most Simon graduates are, uh, with a dedication to social impact. She's co-founded a number of social ventures, including Oasis Foods and Artemis for Refugees. Oasis Foods took first place in the social impact category at the New York State Business Plan Competition. She is currently an active member of GM Plus, GM's LGBTQ Plus Employee Resource Group, and GM Women. And on top of all that, she finds time. She's an avid runner and triathlete. And this just amazed me. Her longest race was a 50K. Yes, I said that 50K trial, tra uh, tra trail ultra marathon <laughs> in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. She also enjoys studying Mandarin and exploring her new home in Shanghai, China. So Sarah, thank you for joining us. Michael, Sarah, I'm gonna share my screen. I will ask before I turn my camera off, I wanna make sure that you are seeing, I'm sharing the right screen. So, so I, you won't see me on camera, but please just know when you would like me to advance the slides. And Sarah, Michael, take it away for our audience. Great, thank you so much, Julie. So Michael, I'm gonna hand it to you to kind of give us a, a high level context of 
of the, the ecosystem that we're talking about. Um, so Julie, you can go to the next slide. Yeah, please just uh, click on the, yeah, the mouse to let the, uh, the contents show. Yeah, so Sarah, I think that uh, uh, you must be very familiar with all of the EV things that we are talking about. So uh, this is one of the uh, Deloitte study uh, which we did, I think, uh, years ago about how fast the EV thing will come into our life. So as you can see, the consumers definitely, are, you know, showed a very welcome attitude to all of the changes in their life about the new energy vehicles and also including the connected drive devices. So uh, we kind of estimate that within like the year 20, uh, 2018 to 2022, all of the connected devices will double uh, globally, and uh, also, for example, the Chinese people, the consumers' attitude towards new energy vehicles, it's, it's, a, it's a great a warm welcome to them. And all of the industry players, they also have showed this kind of, uh, uh, how to say, the very active attitude to provide the products into this market. Uh, and this also brings lots of changes to the overall the, the industry. So for this, I think Sarah had a very deep kind of feeling that the OEMs like Ford or Chrysler, uh, they are all providing the EV cars, right, Sarah? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's okay. yeah, so uh, maybe uh, Julie, you can uh, turn to the next page. Julie, ne next page, please. Yeah, so, so when we talk about the uh, electric vehicles, they're kind of the driving forces. People will ask why it happens so, so fast. So uh, we're just gonna bring some of the points that uh, if Sarah, you have extra ideas, please, please add on. Uh, one we see is that the environment the regulations. So for example, that the climate crisis, which is really a driving force. So I think we all know the carbon neutralization policy uh, so that is uh, one of the big, big push uh, for the uh, countries to launch the new energy vehicles. And also, for example, the battery cost, as the technology evolves, the cost is uh, uh, dropping like 20% every year. So very soon we're going to see that the batteries uh, in the past years, it accounts more than 50% of the EV car cost. And then nowadays it's going to be smaller and smaller. So very soon then all of the EV cars, the battery side, or plus all of the other parts will be affordable. Um, and also, for example, the uh, consumers. Uh, in the past, the consumers really hold the kind of attitude, let's see whether Tesla is affordable, whether really the an EV cars is better than the fuel cars. But however, this kind of consumer barrier, uh, uh, attitude is changing. And also in the past, the people all fear the driving distance. We call it the driving distance anxiety because we're afraid that if we drive it on, on the highway uh, in the US, then probably we have nowhere to charge. But nowadays, this kind of anxiety is uh, almost gone. Uh, and also finally, the autonomous technology. So uh, the, in, the, in, in the next few uh, pages, we're gonna touch on the autonomous, autonomous technology. However, uh, these days, we kind of see that the autonomous technology has already uh, kind of launched in the EV cars already. Uh, so, Sarah, do you have any uh, points to add on these things? Yeah, thanks, Michael. I'll just add a couple points. Under this diminishing consumer barrier piece in particular, you know, I think in the early days of the electric vehicle market, you saw just very similar body styles for electric vehicles on the road. So you can think back to the uh, Nissan Leaf or the early Chevy Bolt EV, and they had this sort of similar body style that really didn't appeal widely to a large group of individuals 
who are trying to enable a very specific lifestyle, whether that's having um, the ability to haul items or carry your family, or maybe you want more of a sports car type of look. But now we're seeing, and especially in, in growing in the next couple of years, a large variety of vehicle body styles being introduced into the market. So in a, in a matter of years, you'll be able to purchase an electric vehicle um, really from anything from a sports car to an electric Hummer, an electric truck, um, which is really exciting and going to reduce a really large barrier for consumers and that they couldn't find the body style they wanted with the electric powertrain. Also, what's really interesting, and Michael mentioned it a bit earlier on the last slide, is there's new entrance into the EV market now um, and into the automotive market in general. So for many years, you had large OEMs, original equipment manufacturers, uh, brands like Toyota, General Motors, et cetera, who really owned the market and you didn't have a lot of new entrants. Um, but now you're seeing startups, um, Neo, Tesla, um, Lucid move into the market and they don't have this sophisticated dealership network to, to access. And so they're forced to do a sort of direct to consumer type model. Um, and it's really revolutionizing how they think about um, engaging with consumers, um, putting the customer, putting the client at the center of the experience, building relationships, um, and hopefully trying to deliver a better customer experience. And then the last thing to note with uh, autonomous technology you know, I think a lot of folks wonder, why do we always talk about EVs and AVs at the same time? Um, and there's a good reason for that. So electric vehicle technology requires a lot of power uh, to power the uh, vehicle sensors and cameras and so forth. And the electric battery allows for that. So as you see increased investment in the autonomous vehicle technology, it has to go hand in hand with electric vehicles. Um, so that gives you a taste of kind of why these two topics always come up together. Julie, you can head to the next slide. All right, so I am gonna give you a taste of some of the major others, and then I'll let Michael jump in, especially because he has deep knowledge of the China market as well. Um, and I know he has experience on the marketing side here. Um, but I've kind of, uh, we've kind of grouped them into three buckets for the sake of this presentation. Traditional OEMs, again, that's original equipment manufacturers, niche vehicles, and then disruptors. So from the traditional OEM side, we're seeing big companies like General Motors, um, Mercedes, BMW, Toyota, these companies moving into electric vehicles, and they're doing it in different ways. Um, for at the top here, I have two images of the Cadillac Lyric. Uh, I'm a bit biased. I'm, I come from GM. I worked on Cadillac for the last couple of years. Uh, but the Lyric is really the first fully electric vehicle for Cadillac. Um, and what's interesting about what it's done for um, Cadillac is that it has, uh, as an electric vehicle, it has allowed a couple things. Firstly, in the second image here, you can see the new face or the new grill of Cadillac. So electric vehicles don't require the air, typical airflow grill that you might be used to seeing on vehicles. And so this gives designers a huge opportunity to get really creative um, with lighting, with LED, with special designs that can be more engaging and exciting for the consumer. And then also an electric vehicle skateboard allows designers to maximize uh, space and comfort for customers in the vehicle. And you can get really interesting designs like the Lyric shown in the, in the top image here. And then in the bottom, I'm showing the Mercedes EQS. So Mercedes is going the route of having a, a, a EV sub-brand called EQ. Um, I show in the EQS because in the hyper screen in particular, this large screen that spans across the dash, um, because it's just an example of how electric vehicles are allowing uh, traditional OEMs to rethink design and technology and kind of push the boundaries in ways that they haven't before. And then in the middle here, you have niche players. These are small volume, kind of very targeted sort of vehicles. I have two images of the Hummer EV, uh, which is being introduced by General Motors um, very soon. Uh, it's a very capable vehicle, has tons of incredible technology that allows for off-road capability, um, which is probably not what you think of when you think of an EV. Um, pretty amazing stuff. Uh, I think what's really special about this design, you can see that you can take the roof off 
and you can be outdoors. And unlike the original ICE um, combustion engine Hummer, there's no sound, it's quiet. So you can be out in nature and experience it in, in a totally different way. In the middle, I have Bollinger. They're actually a, a startup from New York. And they're really interesting because they're doing in many ways the opposite of what a lot of other EV manufacturers are doing. They've stripped away a lot of the technology in the vehicle and they're really focused on creating a highly capable electric um, off-road vehicle. Um, it's really interesting, it has no screen. You can literally hose down the inside of this vehicle um, to clean it off. It, it's really a kind of a, a, an interesting type of vehicle. And then on the right hand side, we have what we're calling disruptors. Um, so at the bottom right is Rivian, it's a truck. They were one of the first uh, electric vehicle manufacturers to announce uh, that they were going to offer an electric truck. And this was, I think, in many ways, a big turning point for the industry, at least from a consumer perspective, because now we're starting to see these different body styles that can be enabled through a battery electric vehicles that you hadn't seen in the market previously. Rivian has strong investment from Amazon and Ford now, um, and they were really targeting a kind of a a subset of the truck market that wasn't feeling um, targeted uh, by traditional truck manufacturers, which is a really interesting position to take. In the middle, we have the Lucid Air. And then on the top here, we have Neo. Um, Lucid and Neo are trying to sell direct to consumer. So it's one of those new disruptive business models um, that we haven't seen in, in the market until really recently. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how they unfold and how they um, engage with consumers, um, selling direct to consumers through showrooms, um, managing after sales, and trying to put the customer at the center of that experience. And the top image, I included it, this uh, interior shot from Neo um, because I really love this little Nomi um, AI technology they have on the dash. I, I think it's just so representative of Neo who is just truly pushing the boundaries of customer engagement with their community focused strategy, their, their, you know, their uh, all electric vehicles. And then they introduced this Nomi AI on the dash, which is honestly not something I think I would ever see a traditional OEM, at least in the States implement, um, but they did it. And it's, it's really fun and it's engaging. You can take selfies with Nomi. You can tell Nomi to turn your music on. Um, it's just an example, I think of how Neo is disrupting what we normally expect from uh, uh, vehicle manufacturers. Michael, anything you would add here, especially related to the China market? Yeah, I think that uh, the, the Chinese, the, especially the uh, disruptors like Neo, uh, Xiaopeng, uh, they are very kind of active to put the new technology into the cars. Uh, and so these days they are uh, talking with or partnering with these internet technology owners uh, to put all of these new stuff into the car. And one of the reasons they can do this is because once with batteries to replace the space of engine, there's more space for the designers of the cars to play with. So that's where the fun part is. So we do see or we do expect that with autonomous driving, AV technology becomes ready even more things, more uh, this kind of user convenient technology we will see in the car. That's great, really exciting. I love to see all these big screens, <laughs> AI, <laughs> everything that's coming down. Uh, it's pretty amazing. Great, yeah, Julie. So, yeah, Julie, uh, next page, please. So with this slide, we really just wanted to emphasize, you know, there's, mm -hmm. a, a really strong commitment by uh, OEMs to move towards electric vehicles. There's been a lot of investment around electric vehicles um, and the batteries, reducing costs, uh, and then moving a lot of the vehicle portfolio to EVs. Um, my company, General Motors, has made it a, a very strong commitment around electric vehicles and that transition around 2035. Um, and you can see for the China market specifically, EV market penetration will be around 50% in 2030. Um, in the US, I think it's going to be really interesting because you'll see a lot of ICE, so ICE vehicles or internal combustion engine vehicles 
on the road with EVs for probably quite a long time. Um, we have a really strong uh, at, um, used car market in the US. And so even if we're moving to selling 100% fully electric vehicles or hybrid electric vehicles, um, you're still going to have ICE vehicles on the road for some time. Um, and especially as infrastructure continues to grow in the US, um, it still needs to uh, proliferate into more of the um, rural areas outside of the big cities as well. Yeah, I think that uh, Sarah is definitely right. Probably that in the US, because we have huge used car market, and in China, that kind of pool is still smaller. Uh, so that's why they are pretty aggressive to reach this kind of target. Uh, so this year, I think uh, almost all of the major brands uh, in China market, they will have EV cars. So you can buy, for example, for the uh, or, or, or Toyota Avalon, you can have the fuel cell car, traditional one, and also the EV car at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And one thing that I think some folks might not know, but um, the China in the China market, the EV penetration for new car sales is they about double what it is in the US. Like we're only around one, one and a half percent, which is pretty low in the US. So seeing, I think a lot of growth in particular um, in China. Uh, and so it'll be exciting to see where that goes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so however, that this definitely brings lots of the changes to people's life, uh, to the whole industry. Yeah, so for example, the charging, facility. So this has become a big business in China because so many charging pillars needed to be put in at your home or on the on the way. And the Tesla is very busy to build the super charging station along all the highways in, in, in China. So these kind of things are gradually uh, changing our life. Judy, probably the next page. Great, on this slide, we just covered some high level challenges, opportunities and trends. I'll go through these quick and then leave it open to Michael as well. Um, cost continues to be a challenge. Michael talked about the decreasing battery costs, which um, it has been significant and has enabled a lot of the advancements lately, but it's still quite frankly, a challenge into the future. Consumers barriers, barriers to adoption is still a challenge. So. There is still, and I'm speaking more from the US market perspective, but there's still a perception around electric vehicles that there's a, there's a lot of negatives or hindrances, um, for example, around charge anxiety, about availability of infrastructure, about type of vehicles available, the price of vehicles. A lot of that has been addressed through the types of uh, vehicle options there are to purchase today or will be in the next couple of years, um, as well as the, um, the decreasing um, costs and um, more advanced technology. But those are still perceptions we need to um, battle in the industry. And so it's going to require a lot of consumer education um, to overcome those barriers. I'm very curious to see how the direct to consumer models play out, especially by some of these startups. Um, they do not have that dealer network to access and this dealer network model um, has been so uh, ingrained in the automotive experience for so long. It will be a very interesting test of those models. In terms of opportunities, uh, innovative vehicle design and technologies, Michael touched on this already, but there's so much that an electric vehicle enables for our designers to use space in creative ways, to introduce designs that are really dramatic and different, and then also power some of these incredible screen technologies, biometric technologies, or whatever they may be. We also have an opportunity and to power our infrastructure with clean energy. I think this is important when we think about um, the context of the climate crisis that we're in today. And then new and improved um, customer experience is an opportunity through these new business models. Um, so it'll be really interesting to see how things play out with NEO, with their really customer centric community approach and some of these other startups as well. And then trends, as I mentioned, EV and ICE vehicles are going to coexist for a long time, at least in the US where we have that robust secondhand market. And then 
from the consumer side, you know, EV, EV brands versus sub brands um, will be really interesting. So I gave the example of Cadillac. Cadillac is moving to a fully electric brand, um, which is really historic when you think about that, um, that the history of that brand. But then you have brands like Mercedes who's moving to a sub-brand type model for their EV. So it'll be really interesting to see how that works, especially as ICE vehicles get phased out in the future. Yeah. And then um, of course, proliferation across price points. So you're gonna see more availability um, of vehicles at different price points as a consumer. You know That will happen, I think, pretty quickly within the next few years. You might be surprised the different price points available um, as well as different body styles. Yeah, here I just going to touch on some of the major developments that shape the China's mobility dynamics. Uh, so as we have just mentioned that the battery electric vehicles, uh, which is quite popular right now. Uh, however, there's also the fuel cell vehicles, which the Japanese OEMs are very, very strong on this part uh, because of the technology. So there is still a fight between these two ways, options, but gradually I think uh, because fuel cell is the eventual clean energy. So let's wait and see. Uh, and also at the same time, for example, some of the hard features, for example, the BEV, the batteries, uh, these are the must have things, but on the connect drive features, uh, also the experience features, which Sarah mentioned, the, which makes customers feel uh, wonderful at home, like the signature at home, the Neo's gesture, uh, capturing kind of facilities. So all of these things uh, uh, already uh, become a nice have. Uh, so these are some of the features which we are, we are seeing in here. Uh, another one is about to balancing the customer's experience and also the cost because every feature is a cost. So how to balance these things to make people, uh, make the customers, uh, make, uh, uh, how to say convenient uh, while we still keep the cost is one of the big challenge. And also the mobility market, uh, those, uh, uh, those uh, uh, mobility market is also growing in, in, in China, but uh, at the same time, uh, people also feel the pressure about the government regulations and the monitoring things. Uh, and also the value chain. So uh, these days we do see uh, a shifting of the value from by sheer selling cars to the value chain. For example, the after sales, but with the EV cars, the after sale value will diminish. So how to balance this one is another challenge. Julia, probably next page. Great, next slide. We'll get into autonomous vehicles. Yeah, so about autonomous vehicles. So uh, we do see that some of the disruptive nature of the autonomous driving. So one of the biggest challenge, of course, the thing is that the driver is no longer needed. So uh, we do see, for example, that the whole insurance, for example, the industry about how much the insurance needed to be, the policy needed to be priced is one of the challenge because the one of the debate that we are having right now is that if Tesla kills the, 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 the people, then who should be responsible? Uh, and also one of the public sector, because in order to enable the autonomous driving, we needed to see about the public facilities. So the government really need to take a lot of responsibility to build all of these facilities. Uh, and also, for example, the energy, uh, industry, the medical, the legal part, we also needed to see lots of the uh, changes in this part. Hey, next slide, Julie. So I'm just going to take a moment to talk about ADAS features. So I actually, in my experience at General Motors, I, I don't work directly on autonomous vehicle technology, um, but I do work with ADOS features. Um, and so I just wanna talk about that for a second because ADOS features are actually features that most of you all are probably familiar with and feel like a kind of a step to autonomy. And in fact, they, they sort of fall on this 
um, levels of autonomy that that we're that Michael's going to talk about next. Um, so it kind of it gives you a, an understanding of you might not have dealt with full autonomy. Most of us have not, but there are some features that are kind of leading us down that path um, and giving you a sense of the trend that we're moving there. Um, so first, uh, ADOS features are advanced driver assistance systems. Um, I want to briefly talk about active safety versus passive safety features. So you might hear about this. Uh, active safety features are a key part of ADOS, um, and there's been an increasing demand for them um, from the consumer side. And then uh, you're seeing a lot more of the OEMs bring these to market as standard on a lot of vehicles as well. So active safety features are, are designed to prevent collisions and accidents from happening. So if you think about your backup camera and that beeping you get when you're close to an object behind you, that's an active safety feature. It's preventing a collision from happening. Passive safety features are more of what you might be used to, used to uh, for safety features. Those are meant to mitigate the damage of a collision that's unavoidable. So for example, airbags. So active safety features are really what we ta are talking about when we think about ADOS. So as I mentioned, ADOS features are advanced driver assistance systems. They're groups of technologies that help drivers dri in driving and parking functions. So that can be park assist, that can be lane keep assist, you know, um, helping you stay in your lane, um, or it could be even advanced cruise control. And then some of what you, you might associate with more of the autonomous features like Tesla autopilot, which is more or less an advanced cruise control type option, or Cadillac's super cruise, which is a hands-free um, driving technology for highways. Um, and ADOS kind of, they fall sort of in this level one, two, and at most three on this autonomous scale, um, which we'll go through next. But that just gives you a taste of, you know, you've probably engaged with some of these features already. Um, so maybe we're all kind of on that road to autonomy together. Um, so Jill, if you can go to the next slide, uh, we have a really nice description of the different levels. So I'll leave it to Michael to walk through this. Yeah, so uh, many of you will ask uh, what's the difference of the levels of autonomous driving. So we, you can see, we divided from level zero to level five. So level zero is basically no system support. Level one is feet off. Some of these features already are in our cars, like the cruise function. On level two, mainly it's the hands off. Uh, however, starting from level three, which we do say this is the autonomous driving. Uh, from zero to, to level two, it's basically the assistance. So level three is eyes off, which means the car itself with the sensors, they can, they can tell whether the road is safe or not. Uh, while level four, the brain off, the car can automatically, uh, automatically decide uh, about how to drive. And level five, basically no driver at all. So level three is the tipping point, the dividing the assistance and the autonomous driving. So right now, most of the autonomous driving company, they have realized uh, uh, level three. Uh, however, the next target is really level four. And the level five, that is not only the technology part, but we also need the laws, the regulations, all of these facilities to be ready. So Julie, next page, please. Yeah, so here I just want to touch on, I think that the US and China probably have the longest autonomous driving distance by these companies in the world. Uh, so just to take example of China, uh, nowadays we have almost uh, 11 national test districts uh, for those autonomous driving AV companies to test. Uh, and uh, some cities like Beijing, the uh, AV cars, uh, already launched the Roadstar uh, robot taxi kind of services uh, in the region uh, and also the national and also local policies uh, towards AV driving has been published. Uh, so gradually and gradually, I think all of these facilities are in shape. Uh, so maybe Sarah can touch on the situation in the US, but I think overall very soon we're gonna see uh, at least the robot taxi will appear in our life. Yeah, Michael, I think that's that's the same for the U.S. You, you hear a lot of stories, I think, in the news about Waymo and cruise automation and all the testing that they're doing and getting 
closer and closer to this robo taxi future, which will be really interesting. Or um, sometimes we think of it as like uh, like autonomous Ubers or something like that in the U.S. too. So yeah, I think also at the same time that one of the biggest impact on us is that uh, it's going to release the driver the at least the time from home to your office so at least two hours can be extra so in the future like we not only have 24 hours we're going to have 26 hours so we can do more things that's why people like a google or like a baidu they invest so much here because with these extra two hours it's a really lots of value here so I think the smart assignment students, we can figure out how to capture the value. <laughs> That's great. And I think there's, there's even a potential for social impact or social good with automation as well, because if, if done right, it will enable folks who can't drive for whatever reason um, to be able to have uh, access to transportation. So it could be potentially transformative um, I think. Oh no, I think Sarah froze. Yeah. Mike, would you like to? <laughs> yeah, I think some signal problem. Yeah. Yeah, but I think Sarah's at, uh, point is right. With the AV uh, being enabled, many passengers or many people who cannot drive because of physical condition in the future will be available for them. Uh, and at the same time, the AV technology is coming to not only the passenger vehicle, but also the other uh, areas, for example, the trucks. So the commercial vehicle probably will be the first uh, industrialized uh, adoption uh, for this AV technology because uh, the road, uh, the driving road will be quite fixed uh, and uh, the interaction between the vehicle and also the road is, is, is much simple. So here we're gonna see uh, whether this will be realized, but we do expect the commercial vehicle industry will be the first one. So Judy, uh, I think basically here is the last page for, for, for our presentation. So I think we can yeah, pick up the uh, questions. Okay, wonderful. Um, <laughs> So welcome back, Sarah. <laughs> Let's see, I have, uh, let me check my, so we do have a couple questions. So the first one came into the, ooh, came into the chat. Um, regarding EV, what do you think are the key unique advantages for emerging OEMs to continue to grab market share from traditional OEMs? And what are the critical factors for traditional OEMs so that they could successfully transit and be adaptive to EV market and maintain their market competitiveness? That's question one that's in the chat. It's a long one, so you can refer to it. But Sarah, Michael, um, if you would, please. Yeah, let me probably pick up this question first. <laughs> Yeah, I think that the traditional OEM, the car industry, it's like an elephant. It's, it's really the uh, capital intensive uh, and also the technology intensive <coughs> kind of an industry. So uh, the profit margin is low, but the overall capital involved is huge and the jobs involved are huge. And every brand of the OEMs have lots of the tier one, tier two suppliers around the OEM. So with the um, emerging OEM for like the EV, like the EV manufacturers, they really do not have this kind of burden because all of the, like just like a mobile phone, the suppliers, they do not need to own these suppliers. The suppliers can compete with each other. So the best one got to be right to provide the product to the, to the EV. So the, it's, it's really like a mobile phone industry. So gradually we do see these new uh, brands, the newly emerging OEMs, they do not have this burden. And uh, uh, like Sarah mentioned, they, they do not need to build a large network. They basically sell the cars online with direct model. So all of these mentioned, it's just gonna give them the faster speed uh, and the less lower cost to enter the market. 
So that's probably some of the uh, advantage. Plus, the government, because of the carbon neutralization policy, is really uh, across the globe. Every country, I think, is trying to push the EV industry. So that's probably some of the uh, factors we're going to mention, uh, which is beneficial to these new OEMs. Yeah, I would just add, you know, I think that, and I mentioned it a couple of times in the presentation, but selling direct to consumer does um, sort of force these new players to really rethink customer experience around automotive and how they engage with customers and build relationships with customers. So in a traditional uh, model with the dealership, the dealership is really managing a lot of the, uh, you know, face-to-face -face customer experience with customers. And um, so you're kind of as an OEM, you're one step removed from the customer. Well, for these new entrants, since they're selling direct to consumer, they have potential for more control over the customer experience. And I think that can be a huge opportunity for them if they do it right. Um, there's obviously a lot of risk to not having an established dealer network. Uh, and I think it's going to be very interesting to see how they handle um, after sales at, at a large scale on that. Um, but it's also, I think, something really that traditional OEMs can learn from is how do we uh, at, you know, really refocus on customer experience and own that relationship building in a new way. So there's, it's really allowing us as traditional OEMs to rethink that and provide new opportunities for our customers. Great, and there's a couple other parts to this question. So the next is uh, regarding to AD, which may be AV, do you foresee any policy tailwinds or headwinds and how do you judge the liabilities in the event of accidents that occur? That's good. <laughs> yeah, um, the, about the liability, I think that's very hot <laughs> debate topic here. I think at this moment, no one had the answer. So let's leave this to these lawyers. So, so uh, but I think that uh, um, with the, uh, fundamentally speaking, uh, at the end of the day, with the AD technology, if it's really the AD tech technology is advanced, you will not see any accident at all. So, so hopefully that we do not see any accident on the way. Yeah. Uh, so uh, about the uh, policy side, I think uh, um, it's not only the OEMs business. For example, the sensor technology is not owned by the OEMs. The calculation, uh, the uh, and the signal transmission is lead to the operators, the 5G operators. So all of the things, the whole AD thing, I think this is really uh, much, much of the picture is much bigger than the traditional uh, car. So at this moment, I don't think there's a, a very, how to say, the government is pushing forward, uh, but we, we do think it takes a couple of years for the overall policy uh, to be ready. Sarah, anything that you want to on that or? I think Michael summed it up perfectly. <laughs> okay. And lastly, uh, the section of this question is, um, with, let's see, with regards to AV, what is your view of possible monetization approaches for the companies in the AV industry, including solution provider, map provider, vehicle robo-taxi companies, et cetera? Uh, let, me, let me address this one because uh, I think this is uh, why there are so many consulting projects here <laughs> because all of the AV companies, they think this makes lots of money there. So about a monetization for Simon people, uh, I know many of us, we are in a uh, financial market. So one of the secret therapy is that uh, all of these new uh, EV company or AD company, they get listed the uh, uh, mult uh, multiple uh, factor is like uh, the internet companies multiple uh, uh, factor. Uh, it's around eight or even higher. But for traditional OEMs like Toyota, the capital market only gives like twice. The, 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 the multiplier is only two. So that's probably one of the biggest uh, differentiator. Uh, and the second, we, we all know that Tesla actually uh, makes more money by selling the carbon credit 
than selling the profit he made uh, on by selling the car. So uh, there are lots of lots of the monetization effect approaches in the AD or EV areas. Yeah, so, so we are really quite positive on these factors. Yeah. Sarah, do you want to address what's the fourth secret <laughs> to, to monetize on these factors? You know, to be honest, I, I don't uh, operate in the, the space of cruise automation, so I actually can't speak too much on the monetization uh, happening or the strategy happening there. But I mean, you know, I will say, though, I obviously I talked a bit about the ADAS features. I think it's important because the, you're going to see the, more and more of those features in vehicles. And as Michael said in the presentation, there is a trade-off on um, costs and what customers are willing to pay for. But we are seeing more and more customers interested in those types of features. So um, that is a potential um, margin opportunity for OEMs as well. So not full autonomy, but um, mm -hmm. yeah. Way. Yeah, <laughs> just to mention a small piece of it. For example, we all know that in the past the insurance policy makers, the, it's, the, the policy price never changed. It's only say maybe it's the female driver, probably it's much safer. So the price will be lower. Uh, however, for a man, probably it will be higher. But nowadays with the connect drive, actually all of these behaviors can be captured. So we are already talking with insurance uh, companies to, about these. One of the insurance company is asking us to do a, a whole picture streamline uh, to study the risks and opportunities with EV and AD. So we do see lots of things can be happening here. Yeah, that's great. This is a great question given the news on chips and I know how it's affected cars are already. Um, given that forecasts estimate that the current shortage of chips could extend well into 2023, how big will the impact of given shortage on the production of EV and AV and the adoption curve of those vehicles? Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know whether Sarah has <laughs> heard any news, uh, but I think in China, we heard the news that the U.S. already uh, lifted the ban of exporting chips to Huawei, uh, to China. So I do see that the global supply chain is gradually resuming to normal, uh, partly. So, yeah, I think this will no longer be a problem in the very soon, hopefully. And when you think also about the kind of the long timeline for AV vehicles to get on the road, I think it's, um, that's something to consider, right? So if we're getting kind of normal supply chain back up and running, um, will it affect AVs, which are a few years down the road? Hard to say. So, um, but I think also just to note, you know, electric vehicles continue to be strong um, strongly invested by OEMs, whether that's startups or traditional OEMs, they're not going away. Um, if even through, I think, a crisis like this, the commitment has been made by these companies and by these brands. Um, so in the next few years, you are going to see a lot of new models on the road. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. And oh, we know, obviously, uh, the climate issues. Is that the only reason that consumers should consider purchasing an electric vehicle instead of a gasoline vehicle? No, there's so many reasons. <laughs> <laughs> that's just a great, that's a great initial reason. But, um, you know, I, I, I think electric vehicles uh, enable so many um, different things. So uh, from, for a consumer. So one thing is at performance. And I'm not sure a lot of people realize this, but with electric vehicles, uh, fully electric vehicles, you get instant torque. And when you think about performance vehicles, people think about horsepower, but you don't really realize the feeling of horsepower in your day-to-day -day driving. You do realize the power of torque. And so that's, the, that's when you go off the line, you're at a stoplight and you accelerate, that's torque happening. And so with, uh, with electric vehicles, it's instant torque. And so you just feel like you're in an, an amazing sports car, even if you're driving, like a Volt EV, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, or a Hummer EV, which is such a huge vehicle, but also gets, in, you know, in that torque. So, um, that, that feeling of performance is something uh, you, that 
that I think consumers will really resonate with once they get inside of an electric vehicle and try it. You will be impressed by that. Um, as we talked about too, uh, electric vehicles, especially fully electric vehicles that have like a battery skateboard um, because of the, the nature of that design, you can really maximize space in the cabin. Um, so you don't have that kind of central channel in the middle of the vehicle blocking, uh, you know, just taking up all that space between the two passengers in the front. And so that opens it up for incredible storage options. Like us women, we're finally gonna get a spot to put our bags, like for real, it's happening. <laughs> it's been hundreds of years, like we're gonna get that spot with electric vehicles. So, um, and then also from a design standpoint, you're seeing just really incredible um, designs hitting the market that I think will, um, you know, appeal to folks who are looking for something different. Um, but you still will see for sure more traditional electric vehicle options as well. Um, but Michael, anything you would add to that? Yeah, I, I think that this will really come to the marketing part <laughs> about yeah. the, the uh, to persuade people to buy the EV car. But I definitely agree. Uh, more than I, I can't agree more. Uh, because the EV cars, uh, as mentioned, that because the engine is gone, so at least the space is much bigger. So it allows more space for the passenger, uh, and also all of these new technology stuff. So you can imagine, you can imagine lots of com convenient uh, facilities, uh, uh, the features, uh, and with the connected drive uh, capability, actually you can talk or even work in the car. So all of the things actually. Um, is the what the traditional cars cannot compete with. However, the traditional cars still have its little part. Yeah. So yeah. So so I think uh, they're gonna coexist for a long time, uh, and the customers will divide. Some prefer the new uh, EV models. Some will still prefer the traditional ones because of the safety features uh, or the. Uh, the, the driving distance anxiety for people living in, for example, mountainous areas. Yeah, so, uh, yes. So please try. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah. Yes. So um, we've got a few more minutes. So the last question is revolves, it's more US based, but is there any concern, or perhaps this is the reason why we're behind China with electric vehicles, but we have an aging uh, you know, infrastructure for our electric and how is that going to affect the uh i guess build up of electric vehicles here in the us do you think it will so we're seeing more and more uh interest and commitment around building clean energy infrastructure for evs so that really goes hand in hand. You need to have the, the clean energy behind the infrastructure um, to really, I think, see the full envir positive environmental impact of electric vehicles. So we're seeing more and more interest and recognition that we need to move there. Um, from a consumer standpoint, you know, it's a infrastructure is a bit over emphasized, I think, because you know today and and today's EV consumers is quite frankly going to be different than the one in ten years. But the one today. They, they, do, um, they do like 80, 85% of their charging at home. So they're not even taking advantage of a, of a grid. Um, mo that's, that's most EV customers. And now as we think about how we wanna get more and more people in electric vehicles, that does need to change. We do need to offer better options for people living in apartments um, who, who might not have access to a garage um, or people who need to travel longer distances. But for most people, you know, electric vehicles we're seeing hitting the market have about a 300 mile range. Your average commute is probably 35 miles one way. And so, and then you're charging at home. So from a practical standpoint, you know, you're, you, you don't really need to take advantage of that infrastructure as much as you think you do. Um, we're also seeing a lot more um, uh, focus on tools that help you get around and take advantage of the network. China has a really incredible infrastructure of digital tools uh, through WeChat mini programs and other things. A US, we're trying to do that, trying to consolidate it with um, different apps. Um, the OEMs are owning that too. So they'll have um, apps that help you find charging stations when you wanna go on a road trip and things like that. So it isn't just the infrastructure itself um, that will help solve the problem. It'll be uh, really trying to educate consumers on um, that 
that maybe that infrastructure barrier isn't as big as you might think it is on the daily. And then also of these other tools that can help you get around um, as well. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So we have one minute left and I want to thank you both, Michael, Sarah, this was wonderful. And I myself as, as uh, Sarah, I'm glad you talked about the torque because that's something that I did not know about. And as someone who likes vehicles and muscle cars, that's important to know. So I myself am even interested in trying out an electric vehicle now. So <laughs> so that is wonderful. Um, I cannot thank you enough. This was fantastic. Um, we've had a great audience participation with some questions. And uh, we've recorded this, so it will be available for folks. And we'll let folks know when that is available. But I want to just, again, thank you all. Thank my colleagues that joined us, that participated and helped to create this uh, workshop. It's been wonderful. And just as a reminder to folks, um, coming up in the later fall, our next panel uh, will be workshops on biotech. And we're hoping to have three different, but focusing on the biotech industry uh, based off of the feedback that we've received from our alumni advisory group. Uh, we thought that would be the next best thing to discuss. So Sarah and Michael, thank you so much. This was wonderful. Um, again, cannot thank you enough. And uh, in the words of the University of Rochester and Simon Business School, Meliora, and uh, have a wonderful day. Have a wonderful evening or afternoon <laughs> where you are and what you're doing. Thank you again so much. Any parting words that you would like to say? I don't know, I'll just say. Uh, hmm. oh, go ahead, Michael. Yeah, no, you're first, you're first. Great. Well, first of all, it's been a pleasure working with Michael. Um, I'm excited now we're in the same country, so at some point we'll get to meet, <laughs> meet up. But um, thank you, Julie and, and Mark and team um, for inviting me to this. So exciting to see all the great questions and interests in the EV and AV markets. Um, I'm really passionate about this space, and so it's great to see all of you engaged. And thank you, so thank you for your time. Yeah, I think thank you, uh, Mark and Julie and all of the panelists and uh, Sarah uh, and also the attendees for the interest. I think the car industry, it's a really, really a big industry. Uh, so we do welcome more uh, people to be um, uh, interested in this industry uh, instead of only finance. <laughs> and uh, if, yeah, if any questions, just let us know. <laughs> Wonderful. Great. Thank you again so much. This was wonderful. Um, and again, ha enjoy your day since it's early there for you. Enjoy your weekend. <laughs> yeah. Have a nice weekend. Yes. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.